Huh. Mi- mi- Mr. Sams? What are you doing clear over there? Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what did you do this morning? What are you talking about? <sighs> My Got word. Up. Came to work. <laughs> no, I'm thinking before you went to work, you... There's an odor about you. <laughs> well, usually, yeah. But well, what, what's more offensive today than usual? <laughs> that, you must have put that cologne on when you shaved, but of course you didn't shave. So what are you doing with that that stink? Well, well I, we were talking. Oh, I knew we were talking gosh. about vapor pressure, oh, volatile yeah, liquids today. So I thought I, you know, yeah, oh, lather dress, it on, dress the occasion. <laughs> Tears are coming to my, my eyes. It's so Avon strong. now. I mean, well, on, it's Avon, so that makes it better. Yeah, oh, have mercy! Everywhere. It stinks so bad. <laughs> Have mercy. Ha! Huh. All right, I'll try and bear it. I will try and bear it It'll here. Be right. Oh my gosh. You see, um It's gotta be better than I normally smell. Um <laughs> what does that smell like? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to even talk over there. Sam's B.O. <laughs> <laughs> oh mercy. All right, today we want to talk about vapor pressure of solutions. If you remember back uh, previously, we did talk about vapor pressure, but that was vapor pressure of a pure substance. Mm-hmm. This is the vapor pressure of a pure solution. Here's an interesting experiment. If you had a beaker filled with water and a beaker filled with some solution, okay, interesting thing would happen as time progresses. And then you seal it with some kind of a big jar, as yeah. you can see in this picture here. What would actually happen, that would be intriguing, is that over time, the water would all evaporate and it would fill beaker number two. And beaker number one would be empty. Now, why is that? Uh, well, it has to do with vapor pressure. Now, you see, because the vapor pressure of water has a particular number at a particular temperature. Mm-hmm. But the vapor pressure of the solution is what? It's always lower than it's the pure water. Lower. So that means that the water will evaporate more quickly, more mm-hmm. readily then will the um, the solution, the salt water or whatever it might be. And therefore what's going to happen as this evaporates and then it recondenses over here, it will it will do that. Very little of the actually when the salt water um, assume this is salt water, when the aqueous solution evaporates, the only thing that actually evaporates is the water. The salt stays behind. Yep. So it actually is going to move all of the water over here. So this leads us to a concept called Vapor pressure of solutions. Vapor pressure of solutions are always lower than the vapor pressure, vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Yeah. By the way, that showed up on the AP test a few years ago. Didn't it they? was they a, a very a exact one in the free question. Response. Why yeah. did that? Why occur? did that happen? All right. So we he said this already, but solutions have a uh, so solutions have a lower vapor pressure than the pure lower solvent. vapor pressure than the pure solvent. This is called Raoult's law. Raoult. Raoult. I love his name, Raoult. Raoult. I say it with deep voice because Raoult. it sounds so good. <laughs> that, was weird. that was weird. Okay, <laughs> assume that a solute has no vapor pressure. By the way, in Raoult's law, if we assume that the solute has no vapor pressure, the um, Raoult's law is Times. so the pressure of the solution is equal to the mole fraction, remember the mole mm-hmm. fraction from last time, of the um, solvent. solvent, now it's a solvent, right. times that's the, thing exerting the vapor pressure of the solvent, the normal vapor pressure, P0. Sometimes, yeah, we call that P, P0. Up there. Yep. All right, and we'll do some math. Now, if they both have a vapor pressure, uh, usually this is a liquid-liquid solution, um, then the pressure, or the equation is, so if I have a liquid-liquid, you'll say P total, is equal to X of A, chemical A, times the P of A, plus X of B, times the P of B, etc. If you've got three of them, you could say XC and PC, etc. And so these are the equations. We'll use these in some mathematical examples in just a minute. Now this actually is a derivation of the phase diagram we talked about recently, is that if we have uh, pure water right here, you can see here, this is his um, vapor pressure line right here, right? Mm-hmm. And this is, the, you know, this is a liquid and this is a gas. And what happens is, is that the vapor pressure gets lowered um, because of this and actually changes its freezing point and its boiling point, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But it lowers it. You see the blue line right here is lower than the red line. And therefore, the vapor pressure is lowered. Okay? So let's uh, do some examples. Right. Mathematical. Okay. What's the vapor pressure of a solution that contains 155 grams of table sugar dissolved in 100 grams of water? Well, we have to find the mole fraction is yes, what we need to do. Now, it's important. We need to find the mole fraction of what? 
of both the solute and the actually well just, in this one we just want the just the water bits. because yeah. this is uh, sugar and sugar will not does, will not evaporate and so I want to find the moles of each so for sugar I have 155 grams of sugar I'll say sug and then they will see uh, is it 342? 342 how did you know 342 grams of sugar I just memorize these things one mole of sugar and uh, sugar. about a half uh, 0 0.45 0 0.45 moles of sugar now the water we have a hundred grams of water so a hundred grams over one there are 18 grams in one mole so that's quite a few 5.56 5.56 so the mole fraction of the water very important is of the water of yes. the sh of the solvent will be 5.56 divided by 5.56 plus 0 0.45 and that'll be 0.9. I'm .924. So now that's just the mole fraction. This is x mm -hmm. of water, mm -hmm. right? So now I'm going to say the p total will be equal to the mole fraction 0.924 times the vapor pressure, which they gave us to in the problem was 23.76 torr. And we just get a number, 22 or something. 20, yeah, 21.95. So let's figure it out. 22.0. Call that 22? Yep. 22.0 torr. Now, it's lower, isn't it? Now, just it as a side note, 23.7 drops to 22.0. Not a big, big drop. Right, because it's still bit. mostly water. It's 92% water still. Yeah, so it's, it, but that's how you do these problems. <laughs> okay, it gets a little bit more complex if we have two chemicals that both have vapor pressure. And so we have acetone and we have um, chloroform mixed together. So we know things about the acetone. We have 5.81 grams. And actually, the math is very easy on this. If you have 5.81 grams, I'm going to try and convert to moles. Then there's uh, 58.1 grams oh, in one nice mole. Amount. This would be a 0.1 moles, right? Yep. Now, this is of the acetone. So let's do the other one. We have the chloroform. We have 11.9 grams over one, and there's 119.4 grams in one mole. Yeah, also this would also a 0.1 mole solution. So the mole fraction of the acetone, I'll call it ACE maybe, will be 0.1 over 0.1 plus 0.1, which of course is 0.2. I can mm -hmm. do that without a calculator. Yeah. That's 0.5. I already put my calculator down. Yep. This, is, this is all monkey math. And the mole math of uh, chloroform, CL or whatever we're going to call it, don't, don't you know, I would say C, clo, clo. Um, would also be 0.5, right? Because it's the same thing. Yep. Now, so the P total will be the mole fraction of the acetone, which is 0.5 times the vapor pressure of the acetone. Now, which one is the acetone? Uh, acetone is 345. I, Not that it matters because they have the same yeah, fraction. Yeah, that's true. But it, it, it yeah. normally you, that would matter. So, yeah, we'll write that. Then this will be 0. 0.5 times 293. It's kind of like an average of the two sort of. But yeah, it is in this case. Yeah. 319. 319. So that's simple. You just do it that way. Okay? Not terribly hard is that question, was it? Nope. All right. This is going to be a short lesson. This I think great. so. We've got some cool demos. So. Yeah, All right. Hey, colligative properties. What's a colligative property? There's a funny word. Yeah. Colligative. It's a colligative property. <laughs> That's radio voice. That was pretty good. Hey, I've got the radio voice. Uh, can I sell you a car? <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's kind of scary. Yeah, very scary. I don't want to sell your you a car. pink solution. All right, pink solution. All right, tell me about colligative properties. Um, the colligative properties is when you dissolve something into a solvent it changes the properties of that solvent. It changes the boiling point, it changes the freezing point, um, changes something called osmotic pressure. I think um, the key thing yeah. is, is, it, is, is it's where something, it doesn't matter what is dissolved. Right. So I just want to write this, doesn't matter what is dissolved. It depends on how much of it. Just the concentration. And actually, typically, well, not always. I say typically, we, yeah, typically, most of the times we're going to work with molality yeah. units here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure all the calculations have molality. Uh, but not with osmotic pressure. That's, that's molarity. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. So, actually, what I want to do is we want to I illustrate this with a, a demo. We're going to go with a demo for you in a minute, okay?
Okay, guys, so I'm, I'm here with some boiling water and uh, some salt, ice cream salt. Ooh, I like ice cream. Mm. And um, we have, as you can see on the screen, um, the temperatures of the boiling water are roughly the same. These, uh, what are they at, Mr. Sanders? Uh, 93.4, 92.9. They're within half now, a degree. First of all, just as a side note, for those of you who are watching out in Internet land, we live at 8,500 feet. And why is the water boiling at 92 degrees? Because uh, we have a lower atmospheric pressure. There's a lower atmospheric pressure. So if you were to do the same experiment in uh, at sea level, you would be seeing roughly 100 degrees mm -hmm. in both cases. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is into this is beaker number one, and this is beaker number two. Into beaker number two, I'm going to make a solution. It's just water. And so the solution will just be salt water. So I'm going to add some salt to beaker number two. Notice that the water is not boiling anymore. But as I stir it. What you should be seeing also on the screen is the temperature changing. Is that correct, Mr. Sam? Uh, it's going back up to where it was, 93.3. Yeah, at first it drops. Actually, interesting thing, you know the reason the temperature drops? Well, the, the salt is cold. This, well, not only is the salt cold, is, as it's actually endothermic as it dissolves, uh, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The delta H1 from that, uh, it's, uh, the heat of solution is, uh, is uh, endothermic, so it, it drops it. But I can see it starting to dissolve, and as it dissolves, what you should eventually, yeah. it eventually starts to boil. It should start to now boil at a temperature higher than the other one. We're up to 94.6 right now. 94, and you cannot get water to boil at 94 uh, degrees at 8,500 feet. Nope. However, you can if we make a solution. 95. It should, it should be continuing to rise as the salt continues to dissolve. Actually, I could add some more. It might dip for a moment it's again dip. as I add more salt, of course, because that whole endothermic thing. But we yeah. can, the more concentrated or the more salt I add, the higher the boiling point. Notice, actually, if you look at the beaker, it kind of stopped boiling for a moment. And now it's starting to boil again. And if you're watching the temperature gauge uh, as on the screen, which you should, which you have no choice, <laughs> um, is that the boiling point should now be um, even higher than it was before. It might take a minute or so. Yeah, we're up to 97.2 now. 97. So we're almost actually at the boiling point of water at sea level. But notice that this one over here is continuing to boil at 92 degrees. Yeah, 92, that, 93, yeah, sitting right around there. Uh, in that kind of a range. And so what we could say that the boiling point of a solution is what? It's higher. Higher than, than the boiling point of a solvent. solvent. Well, I'm back again. And now, I, instead of having boiling water, I have some just some ice. And so if you look at the temperatures, they are roughly around zero degrees. What are they at? Uh, we got 0.6 for temperature 2 and 2.3 for temperature well, this 1. Is, this so. is uh, beaker 1, and, and it just probably needs to cool down a little bit more and we need to have some ice melt. So, yeah. And then we have beaker number 2. So they're roughly, oh, there we go. Now they're both right around point. Yeah. So they're about uh, zero degrees, which would you expect? The water is, or the ice is melting, so the temperature should be roughly around zero degrees. But I'm going to now add some salt to beaker number two, and we're going to observe what happens to the temperature. That's probably more than we need. <laughs> nah. Now, what you should be seeing is the salt is lowering the freezing point of the ice. Not yet, it's still there. Oh, there we go, now we're below zero. You should get, if we add enough, it really gets pretty significant. Let's add some more. It has to take some stirring. Yeah. And that's what we're doing right here. Down to minus two. So, and if I do this right, I, I think I can get it to about minus ten if we work hard. But, that, you know, I think you can illustrate the point here, is that this is now at a temperature lower than zero, and Minus it's a three. liquid. This is also a liquid. It's freezing, and it's roughly zero degrees. So um, what can we say about a solution? This is pure water. This is a solution of salt water. The solution of salt water has a lower freezing point than does pure water. This is a colligative property called freezing point depression. depression. Okay. So now let's fill our paper in. The more concentrated a solution, the higher the boiling point. Higher the boiling point. We just saw that illustrated on the video. And the more concentrated the solution, the lower 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 the lower the lower the lower of the freezing. Point. All right, guys. Um, I've got a bottle of club soda here, and club soda is simply carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Now, it's a very, very saturated solution, probably a super saturated solution in there, meaning there's a whole bunch of CO2 in there. 
So as a result, since we have so much of CO2 dissolved in there, the freezing point of the club soda is much, much lower than that of pure water. Pure water is zero degrees Celsius. This is probably minus eight, maybe even up to minus 10 degrees Celsius uh, for its freezing point. So I have the club soda sitting in a bath here of ice water, and the ice water has some salt on it. So the, the, the water in my beaker here is melting at a temperature much, much lower than the normal freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. That's probably, again, like I said, around minus seven to minus 10. So uh, it's, it's extremely cold. It's lower than the normal freezing point of water. So what I'm gonna do is in just a couple minutes, when this gets a little bit colder, I'm gonna take it out of the solution and I'm gonna take off the cap and we're gonna see what happens. That's gonna be really cool. What do you think's gonna happen, Mr. Sam? What do I think's gonna happen? Well, I know what's gonna happen, but I want them to think about right, what's so gonna happen. What we want you guys to think about is that if you have a solution that becomes less concentrated, what happens to the freezing point? So pause the video right now, and I want you to make a prediction. Okay, so um, as you can see, our temperature of our water is about minus 10, minus 10 point four it is now okay so that's pretty cold and it's been sitting in here about 10 minutes now so I'm, I'm hopefully this is cold enough to make this happen now notice that the the club soda is not yet frozen okay it's in the bottle it's still liquid it's not frozen because we have a very highly concentrated solution so the, the freezing point is very very low much lower than normal uh, water would be so I'm going to take it out I'm going to open it up and we're going to see what happens here Watch it. That is so cool, Mr. Sams. What's happening? I believe that it is no longer a liquid. Right. It is the, now a... It's starting to freeze itself just by simply taking the cap off of the bottle. So you can see there's ice forming here, okay? Now, bubbles are coming out of the solution. When I took off the cap, the CO2 came out of solution, or undissolved, if you will. So we have a less concentrated solution so the freezing point of that solution is no longer really, 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 really low. It's now coming back up closer and closer to zero degrees Celsius. Now, when it was sitting in here, that's minus 10 degree water. So my club soda was minus 10 degrees. By letting the CO2 come out of the solution, I brought the freezing point above the temperature of the water, which was at minus 10 degrees. So the freezing point is now above minus 10, closer now to zero, which is why the club soda froze inside the bottle because it's a less concentrated solution just now. by opening the bottle you froze it yep but the reason you did that is or the reason it worked i should say is because the freezing point was raised because it became less concentrated so it's kind of the opposite it's still freezing point depression but we raised it the freezing point by doing that what are you doing now mr just playing with the slush playing with the icy slushy stuff so he's got the slushies pulling out of there Probably freezing his fingers. That's all right. He kind of smells bad anyways. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a bunch. All right. Okay. All right. Now there's uh, some equations. So not only are we interested, Mr. Sams, mm. in in that it's lower. We want how much. How much? Lower. We love math. Quantitative. So here's your equation here. Delta T equals I K F times M. Or delta T equals I K B times M. That kind of looks weird. A big space there. I know it should be I K sub B times M, and this is delta T equals I K F times M. Yeah, I just kind of got scrunched or spread. I'm feeling I'm going to need a textbook here to look up some numbers. Yeah. So what is delta T? Delta T means the change in the uh, property, change in the temperature, temperature. of the property. But in terms of the boiling point of the freezing point, it isn't the actual temperature, no. it's the change, change in the temperature. In. I is called, now in fancy, it's called the Van Oft factor. Van Oft factor. H-O-F-T, I'm pretty sure, factor. Um, I like to also think of it as just the ionization factor. KF is the freezing point depression, big word here. Are you depressed because you smell today, Mr. Sanders? Not really, no. <laughs> You're okay with that? Perfectly okay. Perfectly content with my body odor. Okay. <laughs> the freezing point depression constant, KB, is the boiling point, I'll abbreviate, boiling point depression constant. Not depression. Uh, boiling point elevation 
Constant. Thank yes. you. And M, and it's a cursive M, is the molality. Molality. The molality. All right. So, all right. Okay. So that's just make sure you understand what each variable means. Now, KF and KB are numbers that you look up on a table. Yeah, molality we've learned about. Yeah, the K, the K values are different for different solvents. Right. Water Normally has a number. And benzene has a number. They're all yeah. different. Now, I is the ionization factor yeah. constant. Actually, let's do a little thing about I. All right, let's talk about this I for a second. I is the ionization factor. So if, it depends on how many things it dissolves into. So if I have salt, sodium chloride, if you recall, it is a nacolnoso, so it completely dissolves into sodiums and chlorides. I here would be equal to 2. two. If I've got, say, magnesium uh, fluoride, MgF2, that breaks apart into Mg2 positive plus two fluorides. Here I is equal to three. One magnesium three. and two fluorides. Right, so one plus two. Now if so I have say C six H twelve O six sugar, mm -hmm. if I dissolve that in water, it breaks apart into a C six H twelve O six aqueous. So it dissolves. Sugar dissolves in water, yes. but it does not dissociate. No. Nope. Here I is equal to one. one. So it's important to understand, you just have to break it apart. Yeah. And covalent compounds, I is always going to be 1. Yeah, that's water. important though. Covalent, I equals 1. And actually there's an issue with these I's we'll talk about later. Okay, so here is that table that Mr. Sams was referring to. Yeah. The freezing point, so for water, the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. They're of course assuming you live at sea level. The KB, the, the freezing point depression constant, 0 0.51. Units on that are degrees Celsius per uh, times kilogram over moles. And then the freezing point is 1.86. And then for different solvents, carbon, tetrachloride, chloroform, benzene, et cetera, the values are different numbers. Yeah. So depending on the question, we'll use this table here. So let's, we'll do an let's example. Do one. So if I've got 15.3 grams of sodium chloride dissolved into 20 grams of water, what's the boiling point? Now, what we need to do is first of all find the molality. All right, so what's the molality of this equation? Actually, let's back up for a second. You can use the equation delta T sub B equals I K B times M. And I want to find M first. That's the equation, the key equation. All right. So I have 15.3 grams over... 58.5. Oh, sorry. Over 0 0.2, it's per kilogram, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, that, actually, let me just, yeah, over 0 0.020 kilograms of water. Remember, it's per kilogram of solvent, not solution. Yep. And there are 58.5 grams, this is NaCl, let me write that out, of NaCl in one mole of NaCl. This is my molality then. So when we do the math on that, Mr. Sands, uh, what do we 13 get? 13 wow. molal. That's really 13 molal. Okay. Now, an important, so that's our molality. That's this number right here. So I'm just say delta Tb is equal to, now I. I. I, no, I, 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 we just did this. Salt was an example I went over just a minute. It breaks apart into one sodium and one chloride. So I is equal to two, right? Yep. Times the KB, now we go back to our table, was 0.51, and the molality was 13 molal. So yep. 13 times 26, and half of that, about 13? 13.26. 13.3 uh, degrees Celsius. So that's our answer, right? No. What, what do you mean? Because it says, what is the boiling point? Oh, yeah. When it's asking for the boiling point, that's actually the change in the boiling point. Water normally boils at 100, at 100 degrees Celsius. So you will, in its boiling point elevation. So it always goes up. Always goes up. You add 13.3 would be 113.3 degrees Celsius. For the there answer. you go. Now, in Woodland Park, Water boils at 92. We saw that right. just a minute ago. It was so, 13 degrees above that. Right, so 92 plus 13.3, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, you see? All right. Now let's do our Wait, next example. We did ask for freezing. Do we want to do freezing too? Oh, if we want to do freezing point. Oh, okay, yeah. So let's do freezing point. You're going to use the equation. Um, all right, so to do this for freezing point, you'll do delta TF, the freezing point, equals IKF times the molality. You're just going to plug in number two times the KF now. What was the KF number? 1.86. 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal times, what was it 13? Uh, 13, molal? yeah. 13 molal, so 26 times 2. Big number. Yeah, uh, 48.36. That's huge. 
Yeah, most of the times you know that's degrees Celsius. Now, this is the not the answer. No. Since it's freezing point depression, we'll take the regular freezing point of water, which is zero degrees Celsius, minus forty eight point three Celsius. Minus because that always goes down. down. And your temperature is just negative forty eight, probably sig figs degrees Celsius. Right. Okay? That would be very, very cold. My guess is that would be an oversaturated solution. But oh well, that's good enough. All right, let's do another one. Um, a solution is prepared by dissolving 18 grams of glucose in 150 grams of water. And then we get a bunch of numbers. It says what? Calculate the molar mass molar of glucose. Molar mass. Oh, this is a classic. This is such an important question. Oh, this oh, is great. Oh, star this in your notes. I have seen this This is like on... why you do chemistry is so you can determine things molar mass. Yes. You can do it so many different ways. This is very, very important because I've seen this on the AP test probably every other year. It is just, it is such an important thing to do. All right, so what's molar mass? Molar mass is grams per mole. So if we want to find the molar mass, you find the grams. Hey, look, we already are given the, the grams. Guess what? We have, now the chemical we care about is this glucose, uh, this glucose stuff that's 18 grams. So this number up here is 18 grams. So I need to find the moles. Yes. And so I have a bunch of freezing point depression data. Hmm. Is it freezing or boiling point? Uh, boiling, boiling point. Uh, they can do either way. So boiling point. So we, it boils at 100.34 degrees Celsius. OK. So, so we're going to use this equation, delta TB equals IKB times M. Because if you think about M, M has, has moles, moles in it. In it. It's moles per kilogram. But if I could somehow get the moles out of this equation, I'd be a happy camper. And I think we probably can. And Let's I know put we some can. numbers in. All right, so delta TB, all right, is um, is uh, 0 0.34 degrees Celsius. Yep. Now, everybody understand where I got that? Is the 0.34, it's 100.34, so the change, the boiling point's a little higher, right? 100.34. 100, 100 yep. And I know that I have an I. Now, it is glucose. Yep, that is a molecular compound, covalent compound, so that I value is 1. So this will be equal to 1. And actually, just as a side note, on the AP exam, they always have I equal to 1 in a molar mass problem. I've That's never nice seen it the reverse because well, we'll talk about that in a second. KB, wasn't it 0.51? Uh, 0.51, yeah. I can solve for the molality, right? You can. Times M. So if you just divide both sides by 0.51, what do you get, Mr. Point six, 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 so you get a 0.67. And now watch how I do this. I'll say moles of glucose, we'll call it GL, Per one kilogram of water. Water. Now, what I Not care about is water. I care about the moles of glucose. Right. But I don't have one kilogram of water. No. If we go back to the problem, we find we have 150 grams of the water. So if I now watch what I do, I'll take 0 0.150 kilograms. I've just in my head converted grams to kilograms over one, and this is the water. The kilograms of water cancel. And what do we get, Mr. Sands? 0 0.1005 moles of glucose. Now remember, molar mass is grams per mole. Now our grams from our problem was? 18. 18. Divided by 0 .0, no, 0 0.1005 moles. About 180, I can do that in my yep. head. The molar mass is equal to, I'm right, I'm right up there, I need a space answer over here, 180 grams, grams per mole. mole. And Let me check that with what it should be. I think that's correct. Yeah, so it would be 6 times 12. It is 180. I have to get it memorized. Plus 12, oh, really? <laughs> I do. Okay. I'm correct, I promise I know these things. It's in my head. Oops. Okay. Hey, look. No. I you, it's 180. All right. I'm moving on. There's also a concept called osmotic pressure. Osmotic. Have you heard of osmosis? Osmosis, yeah. You know, like you know, when I was a kid, and I was there. It's 180. Say, it's 180. I got it. I knew that, Mr. Uh, Sams. I had told you, and you just didn't believe me. I believe you. Yeah, it's Osmotic uh, osmosis is when. Well, what does that mean? What well, is osmosis? Well, You're osmotic, the biology yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. It's when you have a water crossing a semi-permeable membrane. Is that what it is? Yeah. I don't think that's the official definition of it, is it? So, <laughs> it's the flow of a solvent. And in biology application, that solvent is always water. Mr. Through Bergman's a me heck what does semi permeable mean? It means it only allows some things to go through. Okay, osmotic pressure, though, a little different. Right. It's the pressure exerted 
by, so P stands for pressure there, mm -hmm. exerted by the solution. Right. And a semi-permeable membrane, you already said that. What was that again, Mr. It, Sam? It's a membrane that only allows specific things to pass through it. In our case, it's, it's going to allow the solvent to go through, but not the solutes. It's best to look at a picture through it. T-H-R-O-U-G-H. Throug. Sorry. All right. And uh, so, actually, let's skip that and let's talk about this. We'll go to this one. If we have osmotic pressure, and so this substance here has a high concentration, mm -hmm. so it's darker, and this one has a low concentration, and so what's going to happen is they flow from the, actually, it's really the, it flows from high concentration to low concentration, but it's high concentration of solvent. Vent. And so the solvent will travel right. from the light blue to the uh, dark yeah, blue. Yeah, the, the solvent tries to dilute the concentrated one to make it them equal. Yeah, and notice something interesting here is that this blue line is at this level and this blue line is at this level, so it's a higher level. And we can actually measure how tall this layer is and we can determine um, uh, mathematics with it. Yep. The equation actually is a very simple equation. We'll go back here. It's the pi mark equation. Pi mark. Pi mart, it's like Kmart, but pi. Pi I, oh. pi I mart. So pi. Imagine a store that just sold pi. Oh. There, isn't there pie stores? I don't know. I don't know. Bakery? I'm, I'm not a, you like pie? The, I love pie. I'm a cake guy. Not yeah, I like pie, cake too, but man. Cake pie. is better than pie. Oh, oh well. Uh, but a pie, of course, is. You know is, how weird I am? Yes. You know what I learned? You, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I learned when I lived in California? Uh, piece I, of I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> piece of apple pie with a slice of cheddar cheese melted on the top. It is the most glorious thing in the world. Cheese and apple pie. Yeah, I've there's this place called that. Polly's Pies right down the street from where I used to live. And oh my goodness, it was amazing. Okay. Healthy living at its best. Oh, okay. so good. Now, pie. Yeah, apples in it. <laughs> apples are fruit. Fruit is healthy. I'm not going there. All right. <laughs> pie is not a symbol for 3.1415926. Pi is a symbol that represents osmotic, osmotic pressure. pressure. And it's actually the capital. It's like big pi, yeah. Capital pi. Mm, so scientists. Pi. So this is the osmotic pressure. I is the ionization or Vanoff factor. M is the molarity. Molarity, not molality, molarity. Now R is important, is that it's the gas constant, mm -hmm. but here you typically want to use 0 0.0821. And that's going to give you your pressure in, your, atmospheres. in atmospheres. If you use uh, other numbers, you'll get other pressures, but right. usually that. And the temperature has to be in Kelvin. Kelvin. Now we're not going to spend too much time doing the math of this. I've never seen it on the AP plug test. Chug. But you can just plug it in and chug it away. Now, um, yeah, we've already seen that. Um, one cool application to osmotic pressure or osmosis is that you can actually, um, I don't know if, if you know anybody who has a dialysis, kidney dialysis. If you've got kidneys that don't work, essentially what they do is they take your impure blood and they hook you up to this machine, a dialysis machine and um, they uh, pump pressure in through your blood and what happens is it, get rid of, it gets rid of the bad stuff. The bad stuff flows through this and then you get your purified blood. Basically, uh, it's a fake kidney that sits on a doctor's machine, machine deal. Yeah. Um, it's very, very cool and of course it saved many lives until they can probably get a new kidney or whatever the issue is with your kidney. Yep. Yeah, I had a friend who had this, and he had these huge veins. They had to pull the veins in his arm out of his arm, so to speak, so they were very close to the surface because he'd sit at this, like, oh, once a week, once every other week. He'd have to go to the dialysis machine and get dialysized or whatever. Wow. Yeah, it was not a cool deal. Um, s another cool application is um, this right here. This picture is a picture of a uh, desalination, desalination plant. plant. Well, basically what they do is they pump um, salt water in from somewhere, the ocean or ground wells in this particular picture, they then go through and they uh, they use this pressure and then they uh, they, they actually apply uh, osmotic pressure. So if we go back to our picture, what they'll do is if this is the regular osmotic pressure, what they'll do, this is the salt water right they here. They shove it in the other direction. They actually push the pressure down. Mm -hmm. They shove it in the other direction. And what comes out this way is just pure water, H-O-H-2-O. And um, this is what this plant does. And, when, and of course what's left over is a whole bunch of salt or better known as brine. The brine gets pumped out and here's your fresh water that you can drink. Actually many, many um, uh, boats, uh, ocean going boats basically have small desalination plants and they're all based on, upon the principle of uh, osmotic pressure and that's how they get um, so, uh, they take pure water out of the salt water. Yep. My father actually owned a boat, he had this 50 foot boat he lived on for about three years and um, instead of a house he had a boat and uh, they had uh, a lot of the boats of that size they would have these big desalination, not big, 
was probably the size of a of a of a cooler. You know, you put your your sodas in. All right, one last thing in Unit 11, or Chapter 11, I should say. It's called the Van Off Factor. We've talked about what it is, but there's something kind of weird about the Van Off Factor. Yeah. You expect I for salt. We said salt for sodium chloride is actually 2, right? I, we would expect it to be. We'd expect it to be 2. turns out it's actually 1.9. Yeah. And magnesium chloride, we said it would be 3. Yep. And actually it's 2.7. Yeah. Magnesium sulfate is 2, and we'd expect it, and it's actually 1.3. Yeah. Glucose is 1, and it's 1. Actually, yeah. this is the only one that kind of... So the Van Off factor, we say it's about this. So, yeah. so for ionic compounds, we have an interesting. So the big question is why? The issue has to do with ion, ion pairing. Ion when pairing. we write the sodium chloride, for example, NaCl, we assume breaks out in 100% into sodiums and chlorides. Yeah. Well, it turns out occasionally a sodium is going to meet a chloride, and well, guess what? They got this opposite charges, yeah. and holes are holes are holes, and they like each other, and they get connected. Yep. And guess what? That counts as just like one instead of two. Yep. And so the average, if you look at the table here, was 1.9. So a few of them pair up. Yeah. So ion pairing. All right. And that happens to some extent with all of the different ones. Next interesting thing to note, the ones that tend to have more positive charges, like magnesium and sulfate, they have more pairing. positive 2 and negative 2, there's more pairing because, of course, they're more attractive because they have higher charges. Yeah. And this, by the way, assumes that you have a 0.05 molar solution. If it's more concentrated, this becomes more pronounced. The mm -hmm. 1.9 becomes 1.8. So it's very difficult to actually um, calculate the boiling point or the freezing point exactly. You just can give a range, yeah. really, is the best way to do it. But for covalent compounds with the I value of 1, it's always just going to be 1. All right, let's do one last example mathematical here. And this is using the Pymart equation. Pymart. Okay. It's also a molar mass equation. So what's the molar mass? We said molar mass is grams per mole. Guess what? Hey look, they give us grams. They give us grams. Now grams is a very small number here, but osmotic pressures, we can measure them in very, very small quantities, so we know that. And to get the moles, we'll use the a pi mart equation. Yes. Now it is a protein, and so a proteins are covalent compounds, so yes. we can assume that I is equal to one. So we can say pi equals I M R T. Well, what's pi? They gave it to us. 1.12 1. 1. 1. 12 tor. tor. I don't like tor. Yeah, let's convert that to ATMs. Let's. Divide that by 760. Uh, 1.47 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's the pi is equal to I, which is 1, mm -hmm. times the molarity. That's what we're going to solve. Times 0 0.08208, oops, 0821, times the temperature. We're at 25 Celsius, so Kelvin, that'd be 298K. So what would be our molarity, Mr. Sam? Molarity 6. Six point zero one times ten to the negative five. Six point zero one times ten to the negative five, and that's moles per per liter. Now I want just the moles, so I just need to multiply by the liters. Now our volume was one milliliter, or zero point zero zero one liters, right? Over yep. one, the liters cancel, and I get a uh, six point oh one times ten to the minus eighth, right? Yep. So we're going to take our grams. Now our grams was 10 to the minus third. So the molar mass will be 1 times 10 to the minus third mole, or grams, divided by 6.01 times 10 to the minus eighth moles. You're going to get a very large number yep. here. 16, well, 643. Yeah, 16,600. Yep. Now, that's a huge number. Yeah, it's protein, though. Proteins have enormous molar masses. Yeah, so this is something that's a big, big molar mass. But if you, uh, if you don't understand biochemistry, you probably don't. But that seems like a huge number for a molar, for a molar mass. But for a protein, that's it's about standard. About standard. Yep. Um, so you can find molar mass, grams divided by moles. So it's not uh, terribly difficult, folks, to figure out um, how to do this. Yep. So with that said, you know, Mr. Sam's, with, uh, when I'm eating cake, Mm -hmm. I usually like to eat cake with milk. Yeah, you know what goes really well with pie? Oh, pie. A big cup of coffee. Pie and coffee. Oh. You see, it's, maybe that's why I don't like pie, because I don't like coffee. Maybe. So maybe there's a correlation. I do like cake with that milk, That would be interesting. Though. We should ask that, like a poll. We should ask a poll. Do you guys know, is, it, is pie and coffee drinkers the same? And then people who like cake, they don't like coffee? Be interesting to know that. Mm. I don't know. Let's do a cell phone text poll. Te text poll. Coming on the next podcast. Cell phone text poll. Do you like pie or coffee or cake or milk or, or some combination thereof? Yeah, we could write the test. Yeah. We'll see you. Bye.